Louisville, good morning. How are you doing today? It's so good to see you. I'm glad that you're up and around this morning and and taking an opportunity to be able to uh, to just uh, look at the Word of God with us this morning and to have a little bit of prayer. Hope you're having a great, great week. I know Father's Day is just a few days away, so um, those of you out there, I hope you're getting something together and planned uh, for your father, something that you could be able to share with them and just let them know how much you love and appreciate them. Uh, I want to encourage you, you know, if you've got your fathers around, bring them to church on Sunday. All right. Same time, 930. We're going to be uh, we're going to be worshiping. We're going to have just a great time to be in the house of the Lord. You'll want to be there. Also, if, if you haven't noticed yet or not, we we have a men's uh, a men's cookout that is coming up um, Friday. So not this Friday, but next Friday. Come to the church for details. We'll have more of them post on these uh, these websites in the next in the next week uh, to let you know. But it's kind of our big Father's Day kickoff thing. We don't want to do something on Father's Day because I know you dads want to be sitting back in your couch. You want to be uh, uh, enjoying that day, and so we wanted to uh, we wanted to put it right after that. So um, our men's cookout, and this is. This is not just for men, it's for boys, it's for, it's for you know, anybody, you know, as young as two, all the way up to uh, 102. We want you to come, we want you to be a part of it, we look forward to, to seeing you there. Um, a lot of stuff going on at the church, and it's just great to uh, to see things. I mean, we're we're turning on air conditioning units in parts of the building we haven't turned on before. We've got lights going on. We've got um, we've got people coming up and 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 fixing uh, fixing little problems here and there so that it's ready for the church to open up its Sunday school classes starting da 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 July fourth. Now I know a lot of you are going to be out Fourth of July, but don't worry about that. You can still come, um, and if you can't make it the Fourth of July for you. Sunday school starts the 11th of July, da, 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 da. but we want to see you here. Uh, we want to get you uh, together. We're so excited about our Sunday schools getting started up for a lot of it. That's just our, our time to get together. It's our time to be social with one another. It's our time to, uh, to fellowship with our, our, you know, with our friends that are there. And so there's just something valuable about that. And so I just want to encourage you in that. I want to lift you up uh, as you get ready to be part of our Sunday school. Our schedule is going to change a little bit now. It's going to be a summer schedule, um, you know, back in the past before all this lockdown stuff. Uh, Sunday school was at 9 Nine thirty, and then church was at ten forty-five. We're not doing that. We're still. We've got a lot of people that like our services being a little bit early, and we're just trying to fit stuff in. We're going to do nine o'clock Sunday school, ten o'clock church. Nine o'clock Sunday school, ten o'clock church. Um, that's going to be our summer schedule. We're going to see how that works out, and then we're going to tweak it from there uh, as we get to September when we start up our official um, our official ministry calendar starts in September. So we'll work on that then. So I'm looking forward to it. But this is not about announcements. This is about reading the Word of God. You know, we've been talking about family. We've been discussing things with families, and we're just kind of going through the Bible. You know, we started in Genesis. Genesis has lots of stories about family. I mean, it's about God, you know, creating uh, man and woman and the two becoming one flesh. And then we see the growth of humanity throughout those early stories of Genesis. But then after Genesis, you kind of start hitting some of these more uh, teaching passages. I mean, Exodus has this story of the exile and we've talked about, you know, Moses's life and some things like that. But but it really is just kind of, you know, the, the time period is just one generation. So we don't have a lot of stuff there. But I'm going to jump into the book of Numbers. I know you're probably thinking numbers. I tried reading that before and it's hard. It's a bunch of names. And and yeah, it is a bunch of names, but it, you know, you read in there and you learn some things that are going on. And th there's a lie that goes around out there, especially by like atheists and agnostics, people that that don't love uh, our faith, don't love Jesus as we love Jesus and and have issues with us. It, the world, the world values and honors culture, um, puts culture at this high level, and and it often asks the church to bow to culture, to 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 uh, bend its knees to culture rather than bending its knees to God. And one of the things that you'll hear, one of the lies you'll hear, is that the Bible is misogynistic. That is, the Bible was written by men for men and is trying to put women down. And, and I can only say that if you believe that, you, one, have never read the Bible. 
Um, you know, clearly you've never read the Bible and seen what the Bible says. And two, you've never read history and, and looked and seen the way that women were treated during the times of the Bible. I mean, you may look back at a Bible type thing and say, well, that's not what we would do today. Well, clearly that's not what we would do today. But did you look back and say, but what were they doing back then? You know, the way that Jesus treated women, the way that Jesus had women that were followers that he would name, that, that would that would do the things that he was doing, the first person that he appeared to after his resurrection was a woman you you go through and you realize how how much women are are elevated and revered in the bible as opposed to the the contemporary world that they were in and so today we're going to look at a passage that's very similar to that you know it's going to be a passage out of number so we're going all the way back to the time of, of Moses, the time of the exile. And this is the time where the land is being divided. So the Israelites are, are now coming into um, the promised land. They're getting ready to go possess the promised land, and they're dividing up the land. And, and here we see this story. This is a story of family. It's maybe a little more tragic story of a family because it's about a family that's had some loss and death and other things going on with it. But we're going to see the way that um, we're going to see the way that God deals with this family, the way that Moses um, relates to this family. So we're talking about Zelophead's daughters, the daughters of Zelophead, son of Hefer, the son of Gilead, the son of Machir, the son of Manasseh. Now you should know Manasseh. Manasseh is one of the, twi- the 12 tribes of Israel. But if you go back and you look at the 12 sons, Manasseh is not one of the 12 sons, because if we keep reading, belongs to the clans of Manasseh, son of Joseph. So you remember Joseph and his, you know, coat of many colors, and he went to, he went to Egypt and he delivered the people. Well, those the the 12 brothers, it's not quite true to say that they represent the 12 clans. The 12 brothers don't represent the 12 clans because one of the brothers, Levi, was was not given land, but instead was the priestly the priestly brotherhood that was there. And so Levi became the the priestly family. And so his family was dotted through all of the different areas of land. And Joseph was actually given two plots of lands, Manasseh and Ephraim. So Joseph, because of his faithfulness, um, because of what he did, his children were given, were given these, these, these tribes. So there was a Manasseh tribe and an Ephraim tribe, but Levi didn't have um, their own land. And so, but this is, so, so these women are traced back to Joseph. The names of the daughters were Mala, Noah, Hogla, Milcah, Tirza, they came forward and stood before Moses, Eliezer the priest, the leaders, and the whole assembly at the entrance of the tent of the meeting, and said, Our father died in the wilderness, that is, the wandering around, and he was not among Korah's followers, who banded together against the Lord, but he died for his own sin and left no son. So his father wasn't part of this group of people that were rebelling, and so therefore weren't getting an inheritance, but he died for his own rebellions and his own sin in the wilderness, which everybody, you know, died in the wilderness, except for those few people that said, we're going to, you know, Caleb, and we're going to, we're going to possess this land. Why should our father's name disappear from his clan? Because he has no son. Give us property among our father's relatives. So Moses brought their case before the Lord. And the Lord said to him, what Zelophehad's daughters are saying is right. You must certainly give them property as an inheritance among their father's relatives and give their father's inheritance to them. Say to the Israelites, if a man dies and leaves no son, give his inheritance to his daughter. And if he has no daughter, give his inheritance to his brother. And if he has no brothers, give his inheritance to his father's brothers. If his father has no brothers, give his inheritance to the nearest relative in his clan, that he may possess it. This is to have the force of law for the Israelites, as the Lord commanded Moses. And so you see in this passage, you know, these, these daughters that have come, these, these daughters that, that, um, that were part of this line of Joseph, but, but in that process of wandering in the wilderness, their dad died, um, you know, punished for that sin of not truly trusting God. And 
in many traditions, especially in that in that area in that region, there there was no legal recourse for women. They had no rights. They had no uh, legal thing to do. But they came and they pleaded to Moses and they pleaded to God, saying, "Hey." Um, you know, our our dad wasn't part of rebelling against, you know, our dad was part of that general, everybody um, did it, but wasn't part of that rebellion and, and therefore shouldn't have lost it as inheritance. But because he died before he got here and didn't have any sons, um, according to the law of the land around here, according to the way things were done, our dad's going to be wiped off the face of the earth. He's going to have no inheritance for him. Will you give it to us, his daughters? And in many countries, the answer would have been no. And in a misogynistic world, the answer would have been no. But that's not what God says. God says they are right. They deserve that inheritance. And so I love looking at this story of the family, seeing these women that are trying to care for their family, trying to preserve um, the, the the legacy and the name of their dad, trying to be a part of something bigger than, than they had thought. And, and they plead to God and God hears their case and God agrees. God looks at them and says, you're, you're right. You deserve to have that memory, that inheritance, that land that rightfully belonged to your dad because he was a part of the people of God. And and so he deserved to have that and he deserved to have that. You deserve to have that so that as you marry, you may pass it down to your kids and your kids' kids. And so what a great story that is to be reminded that, that, um, that all those myths we hear about people saying, you know, God doesn't love or care for, you know, women is just all about men. That's, that's not true. It's not, it's not reflected in the Bible as you read it. You know, it's, it's, it's not, it's not who God is. If you look in his nature, you see time and time again, God demonstrating love in so many different ways to, to the prostitute that, that he saves the battle of Jericho to, um, to the foreigner that, that comes and, and, and consecrates herself to, to God in order to stay there with, with Naomi to the, the woman that's forced to marry the, the foreign King. And yet she's still faithful to God. And time and time again, we see God honoring those women that, that chase after him chase after him. So I just thought that was a neat story. It was uh, fitting into our timeline. I really wanted to uh, help us to see a few more stories out of that that Pentateuch before we jump into uh, to some of the other stories coming about our families coming up. But just excited to be able to share that with you. I hope you guys have a blessed day today. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll be done. Our Heavenly Father, God, thank you so much for for this day. God, thank you so much for giving us an opportunity to worship you, to give us an opportunity to serve you, to give us an opportunity to be, uh, to be educated by, by your people in your house. And Lord, I pray that you would bless our families. Lord, I pray that you would bless, um, bless us as we seek after you and God, that our families for generation and generation, like this family here in the book of numbers would remember that you are their God and God, that they can come and they can petition to you or that you would give them justice and that you would help us to, to find and peace in you. Lord, we love you so much. It's your name we pray. Amen. All right. You guys have a great, great week, and we look forward to hearing from you and seeing you in the days to come. God bless you all. Talk to you all soon.